Well, Patty, I think we have a fantastic episode today. I really loved our conversation with Cal about ISV relationships. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, very cool. Very cool. And especially, you know, his particular market, the, the legal market, I thought yeah. was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We got some really, I think, specific information as well as some general guidelines about ISV relationships. Mm -hmm. So I think that was really good. And then tell us about the Insiders Report. Uh, it's all about COVID relief and what that means for the Paycheck Protection Program loans. And uh, pay pay close attention. If you have to rewind it, rewind it because there's some good stuff there. You should, uh, if you can, you should take advantage of it. Absolutely. And then I talk about cash discounting residuals and even flat rate pricing for that matter. But how do you calculate, how do you estimate residuals in 2021 if you're switching to more of a focus on cash discounting? How do the residuals work? How should they work anyway? And so I talk about that in questions from the field. So with all that said, let's dive into our conversation with Cal. Let's do it. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. All right, everybody. Hey, we're really excited to be here today. Patty and I are talking with Cal Grant about a really hot topic. We're going to talk about how to develop ISV relationships as you know, a payments professional. And then also Cal is going to dive into some detail on attorneys and uh, Case Roads, which is the company he works with. So Cal, you know, before we dive into all that, let's get a little bit of backstory on you. Um, how did you end up getting into this industry and then ultimately becoming the chief revenue officer at Case Roads? Sure. Thanks so much for joining or uh, letting me join the, the podcast. Excited to be on uh, here with you and Patty and uh, look forward to diving in. Sure. Um, so I've spent uh, the last 15 years or so in, in payments, um, almost exclusively with integrated payments as a kind of key cornerstone of, of the projects and the companies I've worked with and uh, worked on. Um, I started my career in payments as a, an outside sales rep with Global Payments um, here in Denver and then also uh, out in the Bay Area. Um, after that, I was with uh, Mercury Payment Systems. So for sure. those that don't know Mercury or are newer to uh, payments, it was uh, it's now Vantive Integrated Payments, which is now FIS. Right. Uh, but that was really kind of the one of the, uh, in, in my view, kind of one of the four key companies that were really focused on the integrated payments model and go to market. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's where I really got exposed to that, that business process. Um, and the go-to-market strategy around working with ISVs. Um, I, I spent some time as a as an ISO selling um, direct point of sale systems through Shopkeep and NCR Silver um, through a small ISO, sure. and then moved to um, Evo Payments International, which is um, traditionally a, a more agent-oriented um, mm -hmm. shop. Um, I got brought in. They had purchased a gateway, and uh, we're looking for some assistance to help uh, build out the team there and, and create the go-to-market on the integrated payments group. And so, um, spent a, a good bit of time there. We ended up acquiring um, Sterling Payments out of Tampa, uh, which is also one of the um, kind of uh, founding go-to-market uh, ISOs for integrated payments, uh, and then moved over to be responsible for the, the e-commerce channel at Evo. Um, and throughout that whole journey, uh, again, mostly focused on integrated payments and, and selling into ISVs. Um, so I left Evo about two years ago to start Honor Payment Solutions. Uh, and Honor is a um, essentially an ISO and outsource business development group specifically focused on recruiting ISVs. And so uh, we would place them based on their maturity with partners. Um, and uh, that is how we got introduced or I got introduced to, to Case Roads where, mm. uh, where I am now. And so wow. uh, Case, yeah. Well, no, I was just going to say that's awesome. I actually didn't know you had quite so much of an extensive background with the ISV stuff. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty interesting. You've been doing this for quite some time. And you've been uh, yeah. with many of the major, many, many of the major ISOs and, and acquirers. It seems like you have experience with. Yeah, it's 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 been a it's been a really fun, interesting journey, and just yeah. watching the um, the you know different iterations kind of change. Um, the software component is something, uh, and the technology layer is something that's always really interested me, and so yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of driven that. I love it. Well, after hearing your a little more of your backstory, I'm even more excited about the conversation because, as you know, you know our industry, uh, in a lot of ways, is playing catch up in this area, especially when we talk about independent sales reps and ISOs. You know, they're like. They can't seem to get this. You know, I can't figure this out. A lot of them I talk to. Um, and so having somebody that's been basically doing this for quite some time is is great. So so let's start, you know, really, really, really basic, right? So what is an ISV? What does it mean to partner with an ISV if I'm a payments professional? And why would I want to do that as a sales rep or an ISO? How does that benefit me? Can you give us kind of just a real high level? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the the basics of it is your, it's your, 
it takes place for a lot of your distribution costs and overhead, right? And so at the end of the day, uh, part of the reason that integrated payments as a whole is so enticing to the payments community is that the ISVs are bearing a lot of the effort um, in actually acquiring the merchant relationships. And so whether that is a legal practice, a restaurant, a parking lot, whatever that actual end merchant is, um, their relationship is really formed uh, more closely with the ISV. And, and I know you talk a lot about providing value to the merchants that you serve. Um, and ISVs are touching so many different aspects of this um, that they have a really close relationship and it puts them in this trusted advisor role to be able to say, you should go with either a referral channel, someone I work right. with as a referral or our internal solution, which might be, might be a payment facilitator model right. uh, um, or their own branded uh, payment strategy. So, so ultimately what it does is, is their existing relationship with the, with the merchant is what is going to drive the trust to, um, to kind of force payments adoption uh, sure. within their portfolio. So I think what I hear you saying is the ISV, which let's, you know, for those who maybe don't know, it's an independent software vendor, right? Um, and so for, you know, the software company, they are creating technology that's specifically for a particular type of business. And as a payment processor or a payment agent, we want to integrate with that technology because the merchant ultimately is going to get the lion's share of the value from that relationship with the software company through whatever value add that they have. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? That, that, that is, that is very fair. That is very fair. And it's, um, and, and when we think about just ISV as an independent software vendor, um, what we really mean is business management software too. Right. So if we think about ISVs, it can touch, you know, a, a very broad, um, uh, software vendors type, but really it's the business management software that we try to focus on. Right. Right. Sure. sure. So, um, you know, I want to talk about the search for an ISV a little bit here. So you've obviously dealt with a lot of different software vendors, a lot of different processing companies, especially I'm thinking about Mercury. I'm sure this was a big, a big part of Mercury was finding ISVs to partner with. So can you talk to the agents and ISO execs listening right now as to how do you start the search? How did you find case roads? You know, how does that go as far as, you know, what advice would you have if I'm like, I recognize this, I need to integrate with software companies so that I can go make sales. How do I do it? Where do I start? Yeah, so um, I, I would approach it kind of one of two ways. You you know, I, I've, I've listened to your, your ISV podcast in the past and you talk about kind of geographically. The good, the good news is, is that while this is becoming a more competitive landscape, mm -hmm. um, the good news is that they are popping up all day, every day. People are starting new software companies yes. all the time. And so if you think of, you know, 10,000 uh, software firms as an addressable market, that is changing all the time. Yeah. Um, and especially if you're, you know, an independent agent or a, a smaller, uh, smaller shop, um, there's still plenty of folks that are in development that are coming to market right now. Um, and those require kind of a, a more block and tackle, a, a more basic payments integration than someone that's really kind of a larger, more established ISV that might be looking to kind of become their own pay pack. And that's a, and that's a much harder, more different sale. Um, or right, sure. a, a more difficult sale based on the maturity of the ISD. But, you know, for, for case roads, it's, it's been something that, you know, I started working with them over a year ago, mm -hmm. um, and really got involved with, uh, with their entire kind of product development as it relates to payments process and just been working with them throughout the year. And so, um, you know, that, that is not a, that is not a completely uncommon story as well. You know, your good partners, you're going to have a really close knit relationship with. Yeah. And so for, you know, new programs or ISO and agents, you know, that is going to be, um, a check mark on a, on a product. Can I, can I fulfill their needs in terms of, you know, facilitating the actual payment acceptance, uh, and settlement. And that might be using a third party gateway or middleware, whatever it might be that they're, mm. they're using. Um, but really relationship driven. Um, and then as they kind of move upstream or as that ISV, if it's, you know, one of the really large ones, um, that product set becomes a little bit more, more challenging, but, mm. um, but that's a great place to start is really just finding these specific vertical or geographic located. So if I'm a, a huge fan of, um, you know, field service management, for instance, I'm right. just going to focus on finding field service management, uh, yep. ISVs. If I, you know, live in Denver, I'm going to find the ISVs that are also located in Denver and make sure that, you know, I'm bringing them 
donuts uh, yeah. once a month or whatever it right. might be. Right. 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 I, you right. know, cause it's, it is all about the relationship with the ISV that seems to be more important than actually the relate while the relationship with the merchants important, it's really important to have that ISV relationship so that you, it opens the door for more merchants is what you're saying. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. I, I like, and I, I think two things you brought up that really rang true for me. One is, I think our audience, you know, our audience is not tech savvy, really, uh, as far as, you know, understanding development and code. I have a developer in the office right next to me here. And, you know, software is getting a lot easier to build um, and it's a lot faster to build. And so for those, you know, it's like, well, how does that impact me? I'm a payment professional. Well, what it means is if I want to start a small company and I want to service the pizza shops in Denver, you know, me and my buddy who know how to code, we can do that. Like, that's not like an insane thing to do. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Cal, we had about two years ago, I did a venture where we wanted to build a really like basic um, property management system for self-storage companies that are mostly cash-based and moving to credit. Um, mm -hmm. One top-tier developer that I had in about 60 days, we went to market. Like... That's awesome. You know, and it's like, you know, we use Ruby on Rails. And again, our audience doesn't know all this tech stuff, but it's like there's a lot of platforms now where that used to be a three year project for five full time right. developers. Now it's like, give me 60 days and 120,000 a year person and we're done. And, you know, then of course, you know, you got to build features and all that. But the idea is you can go to market a lot faster. But that doesn't mean you can go sell people, it means you can build the software. So right. I love your point about the relationship. And I think our audience, and even to Patty's point too, it's like, I think our audience dramatically underestimates the importance of that. They look at it like, Absolutely. let's just go find an ISV and it'll be something that will add to the all the things that we can offer. Yeah. You're never going to sell it. And you know it's true. You know I'm telling you the truth because you're not selling it now. Like every ISO listening right now, you offer 14 different POS systems and you sell none of them. Really. Like... <laughs> That's what it is. They're all the same. So what you'll find is a much better strategy is what Cal's talking about. And that is go find yourself a company. It doesn't have to be like, I think Square's biggest competitor is the thousand software companies that are making more focused software than they can, you know? So go find these software companies and actually form a real relationship with like two of them, you know, or one and, and really make something happen. Right. Cal, I mean, are, are you seeing this as well? Where you're seeing ISOs that kind of just want to dip their toes in the water and then they don't ever get anything done with it. I, I, I think that's, I think that's completely fair. And, um, you know, there, there's kind of two buckets as well, right? So you have legacy ISVs that might have a portfolio of 50 or a hundred merchants, right. um, and a really good relationship with them and selling into their base can be a great go to market strategy, right. um, or finding, finding a newer developed right. product where you're, you're, you know, going to market with, um, either a new feature or a new platform, whatever it might be, um, that you believe is going to, going to make an impact and be able to sell. And, mm. um, a lot of folks that are, you know, on the development side may not be a sales focus and sales focus right. isn't necessarily on the development side. And right. so, you know, you can provide value and they can provide value to you. So there's, there's certainly, um, there's grounds to be gained there for yeah. sure. Yeah. And I, and I think for me, at least my big takeaway is, you know, yes, there's value to be had, but you have to adjust what you're doing to really focus. It's like, you know, yeah, we're going to, we're going to add case roads so that anytime we happen to walk into an attorney, we have something to offer. I'm sorry, but that's just not going to work like that. Just it just doesn't work. Like instead, it's like, no, we're going to get a list of every attorney within 20 miles of our ISO and we're going to partner with Case Roads and we're going to spend 90 days going to all of them and make a specific concerted effort to do that. Right. Like if you don't yes. do that, it's you're not it's not like it's just like, well, as long as we have a technology solution for everybody, then we're going to sell it. Actually, no, you're not. Then, no. if you're not focused, your salespeople aren't going to understand it. They're not going to come across as a confident expert, and nobody's going to buy it. It's a two way street, you know. I mean, that's really it. It's, I mean, that's what you're saying, Cal. Is it's it's a two way street, and that uh, if, if if you if you leave it as a one way street, you know how one way streets are. <laughs> they only go <laughs> one right. place. <laughs> you know? right. I, that's that's exactly right, and and. You know, James, to your point around kind of specifically focusing, every industry is going to have their own um, terminology, jargon, pain points, sure. right, um, and focus areas. And the more that you can understand and relate that market, um, the more effective you're going to be. So if you go yep. and sell into um, law firms and you're talking about IOTA accounts, uh, which essentially kind of break up between trust and uh, um, operating accounts sure. for 
um, for deposits, you know, uh, their ears are going to perk up. You understand my business. You understand my pain points. You right. understand the bank transfers I have to do on a you know daily, weekly, monthly basis um, versus just I'm selling payment processing or I'm selling um, legal practice management software. Right. Um, yeah. I, and they will they will absolutely, um, you know, perk up. And, and Patty, to your point, you know, a two way street, these ISVs, you know, whether they're they're new or uh, established, um, you know, they have been solicited, you know, on more than one occasion sure. for a payment processing relationship. And so right. differentiating yourself and, and really establishing that you can provide value to them uh, and not just, hey, give me your referrals right. will will go a very long way. Well, right. yeah, it's, it's right. distribution. What the ISVs want is yeah. distribution. It's like That's everybody exactly. wants to call them and say, we're going to give you a bigger cut <clears throat> of your payment processing when you send us the payment processing. And the ISV is like, well, great. But what they what they actually want is the distribution. They want the sales. So yeah. you bring us merchant accounts and then, yeah, that's great. You know, and then that's how you, that's how you develop that relationship is by, you know, adding the value of what they want. Of course they could go to any processor and get a, you know, negotiate a split. It's the extra distribution that they want. So, all right. W- one last question I have on, on kind of this, uh, case roads thing. So I'm just really curious if you could talk a little bit to this specific situation. So you've got this career in the industry. Obviously you could have started your own ISO. You could have gone, been independent. You could have done this or that. You chose to go more internal and have an internal role with case roads help me understand that a little bit in our audience, because I think it really speaks to this idea of relationship. You know, why did you choose to go that direction? Sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's a number of reasons, but, um, you know, one of the, I had a boss at, at one point that told me that, you know, you're, the best way to vote is with your feet. Right. And so when you actually join a team, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to have spent a year with Mike and Dinesh. Um, they have been consultants with Ernst and Young for you know 30 plus years, um, incredibly prestigious backgrounds, um, and I had a, a, a really good chance to to vet the product, to understand kind of where it might fit in the marketplace, how sure. it would go to market, um, and so it gave me uh, it gave me a, a really strong um, opportunity to be able to to work more closely and actually join the team. Um, with them. Uh, but part of the reason that I actually, you know, pulled the trigger on that is that, uh, you know, the impact that their position to make and case roads is position to make within law firms, I think is really unique um, and incredibly well built. So having a really mm-hmm. strong product and a really strong go to market, uh, you know, plan is something that uh, is easy to kind of get behind and, mm-hmm. and certainly yeah. was a, a big draw, big draw for me. So, so that's interesting too, because it brings up the idea. I mean, obviously you've been through this a lot. You've had a lot of relationships, you know, what kind of advice would you give to an ISO that's looking, you know, uh, you know, seeking out ISV partnerships, you know, are there certain mistakes that you would encourage them to, to avoid perhaps mistakes you made or mistakes you've seen other people make? Yeah. So, um, I, I think James kind of made a, a really great point. Something that I've seen, um, programs struggle with in the past is, you know, having a product and, and just going to an ISV and saying, um, you know, I, I'm going to give you a, a, a different split than what you're receiving today. Right. I slightly sharpen my sharpen the pencil. You know, there's a there's a significant amount of business process um, that gets created around forming a new ISV relationship, and there's a significant amount of um, <laughs> development effort, depending on what kind of integration it is, or at least some right. development effort. And sure. so, you know, for ISVs to um, to kind of be enticed and have be part of it, a nice, a successful program, they have to really kind of feel the love and, and know that they are um, one kind of in a group that knows, knows how to handle their, um, their merchants. And they mm-hmm. view them as their merchants, not as payment processing merchants, since they're fielding a lot of the, the customer service calls, they're fielding a lot of the, the customer inquiries before it gets um, pushed to the, the actual acquirer ISO. Um, and so, you know, understanding that, um, understanding that a successful program um, either has to be dedicated uh, group within you know an organization, or it has to be ring fence group of people that are specifically focused mm-hmm. um, on uh, on that software, and they don't have to know everything about it, but they have to know that when that merchant calls, they ha- you know they can't just answer it uh, or or try to troubleshoot it like they have a, a Verifone terminal. They're trying to troubleshoot it like they're using. Um, you know, legal practice management software or a gateway or however you're mm-hmm. connecting. Um, and so really just kind of making sure that they're handled well will um, is really the the groundwork for a successful program. 
So again, it goes to the relationship then, right? I mean, what's, what that yeah. relationship is like. Good. Right. If you're, if you're, if you're checking the boxes from a technology perspective, then it goes back to customer service and relationship building. Right. Yeah, you know, right. If the merchants feel, feel really good about the relationship and they're sending, uh, you know, and they're, they're, um, you know, relaying that to their ISV, the ISV is going to be more and more confident to be sending. More sure. Sure. Yeah. I, and I, I want to, I want to kind of transition and talk a little bit more about case road specifically, but before I do that, I just want to reiterate this one more thing. Cause it's just, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about this topic. I think it's mainly because the consulting practice, this is like my biggest frustration. Honestly, it really is because you know, everybody is like, you know, they want to pay me to come in and tell them how to transition to selling technology, but they don't want to do any of the stuff I'm talking about right now. And, and the idea is I think so many of these ISOs, Cal, I don't know why, but they got it in their head that like, the best partners for them is going to be like, they should just offer every possible solution. And as long as they have every possible solution available, it's somehow going to just sell itself. Mm -hmm. When in reality, the big advantage that our industry has is that we have these feet on the street. Like we have actual real people who are experts who can dive deeply into a vertical and can say, I'm going to get to know this vertical and I'm going to go and sell every pizza shop in my market. I'm going to sell every hair salon. I'm going to sell every attorney, mm -hmm. right? Whatever it is. And by like having that laser focus and zeroing in, they can actually accomplish a lot more than by trying to just say, oh, well, whatever business you are, I think I have technology for you. Like, I just, you know, I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts about that before we move on to case road specifically of like, what would your advice be to these individual agents and ISOs as well, as far as this, this area of like focus, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, so, I mean, one in, in, in ISVs in general or in, in any merchants, right there, um, a shotgun approach to your point is going to be really challenging to execute. Well, especially if you're using a different layer of, um, of relationship with the ISV involved, right. Where you have, you know, things that you're touching invoicing and time tracking and, and case right. management, whatever it might be, but they all have, specific jargon and, and relatable pain points. So even if you focus on pizza, pizza places, right, you, you can't talk to them like their convenience store because they're not going to have the same right. pain points and, and sure. needs. And sure. so even just tailoring your language just a bit to where you're not talking about, right. um, you know, inventory right. uh, as it relates to hard goods, but you're, you're talking about ingredients, you know, gives you, gives you a leg up and, and you get better at that the more you're specifically focused. Um, yeah. For for again for law firms and you know you're not talking about customers you're talking about clients you're not right. talking about uh, you know your your general deposits you're talking about about operating and trust accounts right. you know but these little things are are not difficult to do but if you get focused on specific verticals and whether it's approaching you know ISVs in the field management software arena or pizza shops in a, a, a metro area, um, mm -hmm. you know, really tailoring your language will get a much better response mm -hmm. than, you know, a, a one size yeah. fits all. And I like that right. because that, that's a lot more approachable. I mean, you know, even if somebody was selling, uh, you know, a Azusa POS or a, or a Clover or something a little more generalized, still though, if you, you know, have that, that focus as far as your language and your approach and your marketing efforts to, you know, talk about what that solution can do specifically for that business type, you know, that's going to just take you, uh, take you a long way. Right. Sure. So, absolutely. Okay. So I got some questions I want to throw at you here, uh, about law firms. I let's, you know, that's what you're specifically doing right now. Right. So why are you going after law firms? What's the opportunity right now, uh, to go after them from a payment processing and from an ISV perspective? And if I can, if I can just throw in another question yeah. that kind of dovetails sure. with that, I mean, my experience with law firms is that they've always been like paper-based, right? Checks, checks, checks. Um, it would seem to me that there are, when you're going after something like a law firm, even an accounting firm, there has to be a transition to sort of educating them on, on electronic payments. Am I correct on that? Or did I miss something that happened in the past? <laughs> no, no, you're, you're, you're very much, um, you're, you're very much uh, on point on that. And there's, there's a, a number of kind of key components that, you know, I, just looking at the industry and understanding, uh, case roads market. Um, really kind of, again, further piqued my interest and, and helped validate some of the things that we were, we were going after. Um, you're exactly right, Patty. So a huge portion of law firms, like 60% are actually still on um, either piecemealed systems mm -hmm. or legacy paper. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's incredible the amount of paper that actually gets 
uh, converted. And so there, um, there's been a mass adoption about 10 years ago. They, there's, there are some legacy systems that are um, on-premise based instead of in the cloud mm-hmm. um, that are starting to essentially come to end of life. And so right. you okay. know, that's one opportunity on the case road side. Specific to payments, um, some of the opportunity that really kind of pops up or, or shows um, shows up in, in the numbers of the legal and uh, in the legal industry uh, are the number of actual independent law firms that are out there. And so yeah. this is not a, a mass enterprise or franchise right. um, industry. Ninety percent right. of law firms <clears throat> out there, and there's roughly about one and a half million legal professionals out there. Ninety mm-hmm. percent of them are at law firms under ten people. And yeah. so wow. when you think about, me. yeah, and when mm-hmm. you think about, you know, the the restaurant world, um, mm-hmm. you know, there aren't the, you know, th- there's a very small handful that are actually the large multi-location, right. um, you know, thousand, thousand lawyer firms. Most of them are actually uh, much smaller. They're down the street from you. They're in an office building. From right. a payment perspective and adoption, um, you know, traditionally they are very uh, check focused and, and sending out. Um, and invoicing, maybe, you know, maybe following those up with a phone call. So automating that is a huge opportunity. Um, ACH is obviously a a big part of um, easing the -hmm. the cash to, um, or excuse me, invoice to deposit time. Um, And then the other thing that that probably interests um, your audience as well is that um, surcharging is surcharging cash discount have popped up and are starting to become more prevalent within mm. the um, within the legal industry. And so um, so there's obviously an opportunity as well there to even talk to existing mm. um, existing uh, firms that are accepting uh, accepting payments today. Or that's a, that's actually a really interesting point, Cal, because you know. You know, for our listeners, if the lawyers are doing cash discounting, then anybody can be doing it, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> correct. That's yeah. They're, a good point. they're the most cautious businesses out there. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. It really is true, though. I mean, with uh, like the attorney that I had when I lived out near Chicago, um, I had a couple of cleanup things that they had to do for me a couple of years ago, and they had already switched to like some kind of a digital you know, system. They emailed me in a link. I paid it. I was like, oh, it's so nice. Now the one I have here in Pennsylvania, they send me a paper invoice, which mm-hmm. inevitably it's like, oh my word, seriously, I got to have somebody write a check, you know, um, <laughs> know right? <laughs> it's very frustrating. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's a big opportunity. So I think the question most of our listeners are going to have at this point, Cal, is I'm sure they would agree with you. That's a great opportunity. How do they prospect though? Like, you know, isn't it kind of hard mm-hmm. to get with the decision maker? How do you know if I'm a I'm an individual rep in rural central Pennsylvania? I'm sure I've got you know a hundred law offices near me. How do yeah. I get to them? You, you treat it no differently than you would a, a merchant, and and lawyers are you know lawyers are lawyers, but they're they're still very nice and approachable, and you're going to get a wide array of responses when you reach out to them. Um, and a lot of it, it's going to be, you know, value proposition around the messaging. Okay. And the other is, you know, timing, right? And so right. if they've been on a, a paper, um, you know, using paper processes for, for a long time, yeah. you know, at some point they're going to get very frustrated and give up. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all sorts of value propositions when you have layered in a legal practice management, similar to, you know, if you think uh, legal practice management software akin to, um, retail or restaurant point of sale system. There's all sorts of efficiencies that get picked up, and so you're no sure. longer storing, you know, all these paper documents. Potentially, um, you know, a secure cloud-based server, and whether they're using Google Drive or um, our embedded uh, document storage um, feature, you know, really streamline that process. So you're taking an email, you're dropping it into a secure um, storage facility. You're not printing it out and then putting it in a file right. and then right trying to look for it at a later oh. date. So, yeah. And you know, and, and considering all the paperwork in the, in law offices, that has to be, you know, a really huge selling point. If you can, I mean, I think some of the problem you run into, I have a, a brother who's a lawyer and he's, you know, he's in his seventies. He doesn't change well. <laughs> you know. And I, I, you know, for, for years I've been saying, dude, you need to get all this paper out of your office. You know, I mean, <laughs> yep. if there are ways to electronify all this paperwork, but like James, I have a lawyer here. I mean, he has a lot of things electronified, but billing, he's still, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, I forget, you know, I'm so unaccustomed to getting paper invoices. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, it falls by the wayside. So I think that that's a real selling point, just the automation, right? Yeah. To, for Absolutely. some of these small firms. Well, you know, well, and, and go ahead, Kyle. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Now, I was going to say, I think it's interesting because this conversation kind of loops back around to what we started out with, which is, 
you know, I would imagine me cold calling a bunch of attorneys and saying I sell credit card processing. I would imagine I'm going to get quite a few hangups there versus, hey, right. I'm calling from Case Roads. We automate, you know, attorney practices, we digitize in the cloud and we offer, you know, payment processing services, et cetera. I'd love to stop by and do a demo for you for free. You know, again, yep. making that a little bit of a sexier pitch. But the idea is that value prop is probably going to work a lot better than you just saying, oh, I sell payment processing. Right. So I think right. that that's the big benefit of the ISV. It's not only about retention and everything else. It's actually about sales as well. Right. You get to go in with a good value prop. Absolutely. And and if you call them, even even if you're just focusing on the payment side and you're not comfortable on some of the other um, feature sets or, or pushing, right. um, you know, any of the other kind of components that Case Roads has, you know, from a payments perspective, even just even just having a payments company and, and understanding the difference between uh, being LOTA compliant to where mm -hmm. you've got that trust and operating account, right, um, right. that can that can cause an enormous amount of headaches. Even you know if you're oh. approaching a bookkeeper or if you're approaching a financial manager or the managing attorney. Either way, that that's going to be something that yeah. hey, I'm not just taking payments, but I'm going right. to ease some of the um, some of the trust and operating account uh, headaches. I mean, that's that's a very different approach than um, you know again a, a commoditized or a price based approach. Right? Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well. I think I could ask you about 50 more questions here, but I think we're going to wrap it up. So uh, two last ones real quick. Um, talk to me about um, the types of partnerships you guys are looking for. Is Case Roads processor agnostic or does it, does it need to be a certain processor? Like what kind of partnerships are you looking for on the ISO side? Yeah, sure. So um, so payments is, is not a key focus for our for us. Most of our competitors that are out there um, are actually full bore ISOs. We've taken a, a bit of a difference um, to help partner with uh, payment professionals and ISOs to help uh, mutually gain distribution. Sure. Um, so we are we are you know not fully processor agnostic in that we don't have integrations to everyone today, um, but certainly something we're we're open to exploring based on uh, kind of mutual mutual distribution. Today we work with um, LawPay, which is uh, probably one of the more incumbent uh, processors in. Uh, in legal uh, sure. payments, as well as Card Connect, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously very well known and has a, a large ISO sure. uh, and agent community as well. So great, and it sounds like if there's a, you know, other ISO execs out there that like the opportunity and want to do some serious distribution, it's a conversation you'd want to have. Sure, we'd be we'd be very open to that. Awesome. So I know a lot of our listeners are going to want to learn more about you and about Case Roads. So where would you send them? Yeah, so um, you can go to caseroads.com uh, for more information or uh, ping me directly on LinkedIn. Uh, send me a direct message. I'll be happy to get back to you and we'll uh, start up a conversation. We'll go from there and it's info at caseroads.com if you want to shoot us a note. Awesome. Excellent. Cal, thank you so much for your time and insights today. I know our audience loved it and uh, it was a lot of fun. So Patty, Valor Paytech, our sponsor for the podcast, you know, so excited mm -hmm. about them, had a great conversation with them last week. And, you know, one of the things I came away from that conversation is we need to educate our audience on the podcast more about the fact that Valor Paytech is really the solution whenever you're selling a standalone terminal. You know, right. we talk so much about their cash discounting, which is great that they've integrated cash discounting and surcharging, but it's not like you have to do cash discounting or surcharging to use Valor right. Paytech, right? Like right. ultimately the reason I'm so bullish about Valor Paytech is if you're out there selling Verifone, Pax, uh, whatever it is, one of these standalone terminals, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Genico, mm -hmm. you know, that if you are selling standalone terminals, you need to look at Valor Paytech. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the way that they've integrated everything and the features they have is just fantastic. And so if you're an ISO or an agent and you're selling standalone terminals and you're selling something else, please take a minute and go to ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R, and schedule a demo and check it out. Right, Patty? Yeah, it's it's a really slick, it's a really slick product, James. I, you know, you and I have talked about this before. You know, you put you, sort of the cash discounting surcharging is like the icing on the cake. But right. The cake is really yummy. <laughs> I love it. Great way to put it, Patty. So head yeah. over to ccsalespro.com slash Valor. Check it out. Okay. And now... Here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. All right, everybody. So in Questions from the Field, I'm going to answer a question I literally just got about 10 minutes before we started this podcast, Patty. Um, oh, perfect, James. Yeah, so an agent uh, just emailed me and said, I'm trying to set some goals and objectives for the year as far as earning, and I'm mm -hmm. switching to selling cash discounting almost exclusively. 
And I'm having a hard time understanding how the residual works when it comes to cash discounting. How do I figure out how much residual I'm going to make? That's a really good question, James, because yeah. I, you know, I know that you've explained this to me, but this is, you know, it, it, yeah. it kind of defies reasoning in some respects. It, it does in some ways. And, and I think I can give you the five minute spiel. Now, I probably am going to do a, a full, you know, content video with this uh, mm-hmm. sales rep Q&A session like I've been doing um, to dive a little bit deeper. I'll make a little spreadsheet and share it with people. But the idea here is ultimately there's a cost of processing, right? Right. And so like in any business, you're going to have revenue, you're going to have expenses. Um, Mm -hmm. And so in this case, let's talk about the expenses first. So in the U.S., the average cost of residual is 1.7%. Okay. Right. Now, as you know, Patty, that can vary a lot. If we have a really small ticket, you know, $7, $5 average ticket hot dog stand, they might have a a effective rate of interchange of 5%, you know. Sure. Um, And we might have a- averages out. Averages out, Right. But about 1.7%. So if we look at the interchange cost, then we have to add in the cost from the card brands, the dues and assessments from Visa, MasterCard, Discover, et cetera. Even mm-hmm. Amex now has their 15 basis point assessment, 30 if it's card not present. So right. we put all that together. Um, you end up being somewhere around usually 1.9%. Um, okay. You know, so about 20 basis points is kind of the general that's cost. That's what I was thinking. 20 yep. is pretty much close, right? Right. So 1.7% uh, interchange cost. 20 basis points or 0.2% for VMD card brand fees and Amex assessments and all that. Now we're at 1.9% total cost. Then you're going to have your Schedule A cost. So we can, Mm. you know, that's going to be maybe, you know, whatever it is, three, four basis points, uh, you know, one, two, three, four cents, you know, something, some some cost that the processor or ISO is keeping out of each transaction. So we add all that in. We're probably around that 2% mark. So Mm -hmm. when we look at the average cost of processing for a merchant, it's about 2% is the average. It's going to fluctuate between 1.5 and 2.5, but it's about 2% is a really good average number to go after. So if you're selling again, if you're just, you know, if you're targeting one specific business type, obviously dig in a little bit deeper, but just as a general rule, 2%. So we look at the, that's the cost. So now we got to look at our our revenue. So how much money, what's the revenue that's coming in? Well, the revenue in this case is going to be the fees that you are collecting. And this is where I think a lot of agents get a little confused with cash discounting because you have to understand there's actually two very separate things happening here. They, They happen to balance each other out, but they are separate things. You are still charging the merchant, you know, cash discounting is ultimately flat rate pricing. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you're charging the merchant 3.99%, you're just charging them flat rate. The fact that they're also collecting that amount of money from the consumer to offset it is important, but from a residual calculation, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant, right? right. It's irrelevant yes. to the ISO or the agent. Exactly. Yeah. It's just flat rate pricing is all it is. And so right. you calculate your residuals the same way you would flat rate pricing. You know, you have about a 2% cost and again, it's going to fluctuate a little bit, but somewhere around there. And mm-hmm. then you say, well, I'm going to collect, you know, I'm going to charge the merchant a 4% flat rate and I'm going to charge the customer 4%, let's just say to make the math easy. Well, you're right. going to make about 200 basis points of margin there, total okay. profit, 4% minus 2%, of course, is 2%. So now we take 2%. So if we have a merchant doing, you know, 10,000 a month in volume, we're going to make, uh, we're not going to make, but there's going to create $200 in margin, Right. Now right. we're going to look at our residual percentage. What percentage of that money are you getting? What's your residual cut, your residual percentage? So let's just say, again, to make the math easy, let's say it's 50%. Again, I'm not trying mm-hmm. to give specifics at all. I'm just trying to make the math easy. You might be right. a little less, a little more, whatever. But let's say you're at 50% residual, uh, just for hypothetical purposes. So $10,000 a month merchant is generating 2% profit. So that's 200 bucks. You're at 50% residual. That's $100 a month that you're going to make off of that merchant. Um, and then you can just scale the numbers from there. And the thing that I love about cash discounting that makes it a lot easier to calculate residual is that really regardless of the size of the merchant, your margin percentages stay about the same, which is kind of crazy. So if you know, yeah. you, if you look at that and say, I'm going to make a hundred bucks on a merchant doing 10,000 a month, you're probably going to make 500 bucks a month on a merchant doing 50,000. Sure. Now with traditional processing, you generally have to give lower prices for a merchant that's doing more volume, Right. So right. as a result, of course, you know, your, your, coming down. Yeah, your percentage of profit is coming down, your, your gross profits going up. Um, mm-hmm. But with cash discounting, it's not like that. Generally, you're doing the same 3.99 or 3.5 or 3% or whatever you're doing. You're, you're generally doing that same flat rate regardless of volume. Uh, as it gets really, really big, you might give them a little bit of a break, but, you know, ultimately that's where you're going to be at. So if I was a, a sales rep selling cash discounting and I wanted to calculate residuals, what I would use is I would look at the, the merchants I'm selling. If I'm going to be doing just every merchant out there, probably about 20,000 a month is a good average number as far as volume goes. 
um, then you're going to figure that if you're, you know, just take whatever you're selling it at and take away 2%. So if you're doing three and a half percent, take away 2%, one and a half percent's left. Multiply that one and a half percent or whatever's left over, multiply that by the the average volume of the merchants you're selling, which in this case about, you know, 20,000 a month would be like a general average. Okay. Then you take that number and you say, okay, how many sales am I going to make? Multiply it out. That's your residual. Good stuff, James. So, there you Simple. go. There's there's a short version. I'll make a spreadsheet and do something. So follow us at ccsalesper.com and I'll get you some more content down the road here in the next few weeks on that too. Excellent. Thanks, James. Thank you, Patty. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. So, James, we have some good news out of Washington. Um, Congress has passed and President Trump has signed into law the new uh, COVID relief package that's right. going to deliver some much needed help to ISOs, MLSs, and their merchants. Yes. Um, about $284 billion actually is the uh, is okay. the price tag on that, which is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, to put that in perspective, I think last year, SBA gave out 5 million PPP loans worth more than $525 billion. So right. it's about half again as much, you know? Yep. Um, so included in that is a uh, 35 billion specifically earmarked for first time PPP loan applicants and 15 billion for first time applicants with 10 or fewer employees. Okay. All right. As well as those located in economically distressed areas. Okay. Now businesses that secured PPP loans last year under the CARES Act can request second round loans with some restrictions. Uh, for example, they can't exceed $2 million the ceiling under the CARES Act was $10 million. Right, okay. And, and unlike the first round of loans, which were available to businesses with fewer than 500 employees, it's now 300 or fewer employees. Okay, okay. And they also need to demonstrate that they lost 25% of gross receipts uh, during any one quarter of 2020 relative to 2019. Yep, I'm I'm well aware of that one, Patty. That's the one I hate the most. That's the yeah, one. That, actually, that's... <laughs> I, I I barely made that one, James. But did I did you really? make that one. Yeah, well, I did there you make go. that one. So at least yeah. one of us is getting it, you know. Right, right. Well, and it's um, it's like I, you know I've told I tell people it's like you know I, I can't really complain. It's like I'm complaining because my business is growing so much I can't right, get the payroll right. protection Your business program. Is growing so much. Hey, <laughs> We're way up complain. in revenue, and now I can't get any government help. Dog on it. Oh yeah. darn it! Uh, anyway. Darn it! But hey, that uh, means people are getting revenue. You know, getting more money so they. Right. Spend money on your stuff. So yeah, exactly right. Yes, exactly. And in another win for borrowers, which I thought was very interesting, the new law clarifies that forgiven loans are not taxable income, and that expenses paid with the loan proceeds are deductible. Now, this had been an issue because although the CARES Act had said forgiven PPP loans should not count as taxable income, and that you know, deductible expenses should remain deductible. The Treasury last summer issued a ruling, yeah, claiming that covered expenses were not deductible. So the new legislation wow. basically overrides that. That's insane. Which, I actually didn't yeah. know that. That's a big win for us. So that's basically, a big win. So basically, all the money that we got from the payroll protection program that's been forgiven, we don't have to claim that as income, and then right. we used it for payroll and everything else. And that the payroll expenses is still a, a, a deductible expense. Right. So it's like a double dip. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> Not, it's a nice double dip too, right? Uh, um, yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, we, yeah, and we, we wonder, and we wonder why our government's running a huge deficit, but that's a whole other conversation. So let's keep going. But you know, just Hey, I'll take it that, though. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know, I say to people, I've been working over 50 years in you know, my life and I've paid taxes and given right. into all the funds. And last year was the first time I took a dole. And well, you know, it's I'm funny. It's, it's really funny you say that. My, uh, I just uh, got to spend some time with my aunt and uncle, and she mm -hmm. owns uh, one of the largest costume uh, businesses in the country, like Halloween costumes and rental costumes and stuff. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. uh, in Florida, and uh, she said almost an identical thing. I picked her up at the airport, and I was talking about payroll protection, and she said, "You know, I've been." Uh, she's had a th for thirty five years. She's had that business. She said, "I've never received a dime from the government until last year." So yep. she was pretty happy about it too. So I yeah, think it's, it's mean, been a know, success. You know what the heck? You know, right. I mean. So, I mean, but anyways, you know, just to kind of backtrack, because I know you and I did a webinar on this about a year ago, but, right. you know, right. I'm sure there's new listeners and people need a reminder that, you know, PPP loans are unlike anything else that uh, any other loans that SBA guarantees, you right. know, because they're unsecured. Right. Yes. And, you know, um, unlike most SBA-backed loans, 
eligible PPP. That is such a hard one to roll off the tongue. PPP yes. Yes. eligible PPP applicants can include sole proprietors and independent contractors like right. MLSs, as well as right. self-employed individuals. So, right. Right. you know, that's a big and you know. Big so if thing. they had a big uh, if they had a big drop in residual revenue that second quarter, yeah. um, and it was more than twenty five percent drop over last year. That's a big, that's there you a go. good help. Yeah, they can go back. Hand, yeah, you know? that's interesting. And yeah. of course, the biggest advantage, obviously, is that the loans are forgivable, provided the funds right. are used to cover payroll and other overhead. Right. Now, the CARES Act specifically permits loan monies to be applied to rent, utilities, and uh, mortgage interest, right. in addition to payroll. Right. But the new law expands that list of expenses. Okay. Uh, to include things like supplying employees with uh, PP. Uh, what do you call it? Protective, personal protective gear. Sure. Okay. You know, like masks and shields and oh, stuff. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Also, costs associated with outside dining. You know, I know. Um, in, oh, yeah, sure. In D.C. and Baltimore, too, and a couple of the counties around me, uh, the local governments were helping restaurants transition to outside dining. And right, for the right. fall, they helped, you know, they would loan money for these heating elements. Well, now, you can deduct that money um, oh, wow. if you spent it out of pop pocket, which I think is a big win That's for it, yeah. restaurants. Yeah, for right? sure. And um, also another thing that I thought was interesting, property damage associated with public disturbances last year that oh. were not covered by insurance. Sure. Yeah. That's and a big deal for cities like in cities, right? Yeah, Baltimore and, and yeah, others. Sure. So, but, you know, in addition to all this, um, there's another thing that I found in the new legislation. It forgives up to eight months of principal and interest. Mm. The SBA will forgive up to eight months of principal and interest on SBA Section 7A and 504 microloans. Mm. Okay. Which is really big. Um, yeah. You know, huh. Section 7A loans, I think, are, you know, they're received through an SBA lender and it can be used for any kind of working capital, equipment, inventory, right, right. even acquisitions. <clears throat> sure. And it's funny because they call these micro loans, but you can borrow up to $5, billion, $5 million. Right. Uh, you know, so that's right. not too bad. You have to have fewer than 500 employees. Right. Or less than $7.5 million in annual receipts. Hmm. Okay. And the 504 micro loan po- program is uh, geared more towards economic development and job creation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's available for purchase of commer- commercial real estate, uh, equipment, things like that to help grow the business. Right. Uh, they also have a $5 million limit and similar requirements to the, to the section seven, a loans, right. Uh, except that they have maturity rates that are 10 to 20 years, depending on the, um, nature of the loan and they are fixed, fixed rates. So, you know, it was a lot of haggling. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty towards the end of the year. But I think that this is a big win for uh, ISOs and, yeah. and agents. Absolutely. Wow. Well, Patty, thanks so much for sharing all that detail. And hopefully uh, our listeners are going to dive in and take a look and see if they qualify. And if not, at the very least, educate your merchants that, hey, there's more that, help. That there's more help out there. And, you know, I know yeah. that this is a lot to take in. So if you have to listen to it twice, you might want to rewind yep. And, yep. and do that. Because sure. this is definitely something you need to be aware of. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Patty. This episode of the Merchant Sales Podcast was brought to you by Valor Paytech, the technology company that is revolutionizing cash discounting and surcharging with innovative features like dual mid support, waive the fee options, and even adding non-cash adjustment charges to tips. Now, all of this is made possible by a variety of technology devices and solutions such as gateways, tabletop point of sale devices, and features like SMS text messaging and e-invoicing, all with cash discounting in mind. Valor Pay Tech, bold ideas, smart execution. Make sure you head over to ccsalespro.com slash valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash valor, V-A-L-O-R. Schedule your free demo today and watch videos and learn more about this amazing technology solution. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of greensheet.com and ccsalespro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.